Everyone, welcome to everybody who's watching online. And uh, it's really good to be here this evening. It's uh, great that uh, you've turned out again to hear a bit more about the Beatitudes. I've been here in the church since uh, 3.30 uh, because we've been rehearsing in the choir because we've got about 15 or 18 people up here who will be singing and leading the worship for the Christmas carol service. And um, I didn't realize that I was going to finally make it into a worship group, I tell you. It was a bit touch and go, it was a bit touch and go as to whether I was going to be allowed to stay or not. Uh, but um, Helena came up and she said, Chris, if you have difficulty, just mime, just mime it, and that will be okay. And uh, we'll, we'll see if, I'm, uh, if I can get through the rest of the rehearsals and pass the test to be in the choir. Actually, I'm sure I will do. I think I'm going to be all right. I'm a good mimer. Anyway, so welcome to the Bible study this evening. We are continuing, as I've said, uh, on the Beatitudes of Jesus from the Sermon of the Mount. We are progressing through what each of these Beatitudes means for us as Christians. It's the Christian charter contained within the Beatitudes. It's the gospel, if you like. And uh, it, it brings into us, when we take on these Beatitudes, when we follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then he builds us up with these spiritual characteristics to sustain us uh, through our Christian walk, to grow us, but also so that we can be effective in the world. You know that the word beatitude means a deep-seated blessedness in the core of our souls, that we are at, at one with God and Jesus, at, at one with ourselves, and, uh, and uh, actually we are willing and able and we are growing in the spiritual characteristics to be more like Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And in fact, um, the next slide shows us that we're, we're starting to build a spiritual, a spiritual stairway. And as I've said many times, uh, uh, these, are, these Beatitudes are building one on, on the other, one on the other. And so far, we've looked at these two. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We need a broken spirit to realize we need a savior. And when we become a Christian, we go through a whole process of, of grieving and, and repenting for our sins that put Jesus on the cross. And then we start to become much more aware about the sins of the world. And we start to pray into, we start to pray into the things that are happening that grieve God's spirit. And because we're Christians, they grieve ours as well. And the Beatitudes, they, they, uh, they, they contain successive fundamental spiritual characteristics that I believe Jesus wanted all of his disciples to work at, to actually take hold of, to learn about, and to add into our lifestyle. Um, I would call it, um, um, as part of our discipleship with Jesus, the word disciple, as we know, means discipline. And so each of these Beatitudes, they're not a heavy thing from Jesus, but they do demand a bit of a discipline from us to take them on board fully, to learn from what they're, they're saying, and to act them all out in our lives. These Beatitudes, I believe, are also part of our sanctification. The more we take on this amazing sermon that Jesus gave, the more we take on the characteristics of what it is to be a Christian, the more set apart, if you like, the more holy. If, if, you know, for us, we become more holy and more holy because we are uh, being changed from glory to glory in our sanctification through our discipleship following Jesus. And so the third uh, spiritual state that we're going to study tonight is this one. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And uh, uh, meekness goes along with gentleness. I mean, gentle or having a gentle spirit uh, is kind of the characteristics that I've chosen. So we have a broken spirit. We, we come through repentance. And as we're taking on more and more the Christian way, we have what's known as a meek or a gentle spirit. And um, when it comes to meekness, they say there are two types of people in the world, and you can tell who they are when they enter a room. Hey, everyone, look at me. Well, hello, how are you? What's happening in your life? And uh, everyone will know that I immediately struggle with meekness. <laughs> Those who know me well 
will know that uh, I have an extrovertedness, particularly if I've had too much caffeine or coffee. And, uh, you know, you know the, these things take work, don't they? We have to work at these things. And, uh, and that's partly why we're doing some of this teaching. So the third spiritual characteristic of the Christian charter is a meek or a gentle spirit. And the reward uh, for this characteristic is the inheritance of the earth. Amen. So it's always good to define these things. What is meekness? Uh, what is meekness or what is being meek? What is the characteristic of being meek? Well, up here on our screens, we've got the Oxford Dictionary definition of meek. And it says this, meek, the quality of being quiet, gentle, and always ready to do what other people want without expressing your own opinion. I'll say that again. Here's the Oxford Dictionary definition of meek. The quality of being quiet, gentle, and always ready to do what other people want without expressing your own opinion. And one of the great advantages of being up on stage, I can see that you are all pondering this. Is this the biblical definition of being meek or meekness? Some are pondering and others are going, the faces are coming, even one or two have reached for the phones to look up the biblical definition of meekness. So, do you think that this is the biblical definition of meekness? It's half right, but it's not all right, okay? It's not all right. So, um, meek or being gentle or, 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 or having a meekness about you from a biblical sense does not mean that we are a doormat without opinions or expressing our opinions to one another in the world or to our whole Christian family. So the, 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 the back end of this Oxford Dictionary definition isn't really the biblical definition of meekness. And we will unpack this um, in, a, uh, in a moment. And we will see that the biblical definition of meekness has a very sharp edge to it. Okay, Christians are not doormats without opinions. We do have opinions and uh, we can express our opinions. Um, and God may demand, he, God may demand for some of us that we need to express an opinion in the world, particularly if the world is going against the things of God. Um, but uh, there is a time, there is a place uh, to express these uh, opinions. Um, and there's a wisdom that is required, um, and we must do everything in love. We must love one another as Christians and love those who are not Christians as, our, as they are our neighbors. So, what is a better or a fuller biblical definition of meek, being gentle of spirit? And how does meekness show itself in some of the prominent believers in God or Christian believers in the Bible from the Old Testament and the New? And how should we as Christians be meek? How should we be gentle of spirit? So I hope, I hope you've been drawn in uh, uh, to uh, particularly the Oxford Dictionary definition has made you really think. And um, I'm going to give you a, a much fuller definition of what the Bible says meekness is. So the Greek word is praus, praus, um, and uh, meekness in scripture has a much fuller and deeper significance in fact than just the behavior. So being meek or being gentle, we often see as, as someone from a behavioral point of view. But actually these characteristics, remember, they're spiritual characteristics, they're building our characters as Christians. So it starts from the inside first and then it comes out uh, in our behavior. So biblical meekness is an inwrought, it's an inward being in our souls. Um, and to be uh, of meek or to have a gentle spirit uh, first is to have the right spirit and attitude in our relationship to God Almighty as our Heavenly Father. 
So meekness that the Bible is talking about is having the right temper of spirit. When we think of the word temper, we think of being aggressive and stuff's coming out of us. We've got an angry temper. But I think I'm right in saying that when you're creating something in metalwork, you temper it by tapping it. You hit it and you, and you tap it and, and you're creating uh, the right shape for the article for it to be fit for purpose. So meekness really is having the right attitude, if you like, the right tempering in our relationship with God, which means that, and this is the challenge of a gentle and a meek spirit, it's us in relationship with God first, but it means that we are ready and willing to accept God's dealing with us as always being good. God is good all the time, and whatever is happening in our lives, a gentle spirit, a, 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 a meek spirit in our relationship with God is to see that whatever's happening in our lives, God is always good, and we are not going to be a people who dispute him or the things that happen. Now, am I the only one who finds that hard? I've already said that I'm an extrovert. Hello, I'm here. Look at me. Um, and there are times, certainly in my life, when, when actually I know I have not and I do not have a, a gentle or a meek spirit when it comes to my Heavenly Father. Um, it doesn't mean, by the way, that we can't have opinion. Do you remember I said it's, we can have opinion, and we can have opinions, and we can have, if you like, a dispute with God, if you like, in our working things out. But we're supposed to have that questioning of God, or we're supposed to have that debate with God, with a meek and gentle spirit, knowing that he is always good, and his dealings with us are always going to be good, even if I feel I'm being persecuted or I'm suffering. Does that make any sense? So this meekness of spirit actually has got a very deep-seated, sharp angle to it. It's not going to be uh, necessarily an easy thing for us to take on board, particularly if we are struggling in some way with what life has thrown at us, sicknesses or pains or strugglings in the world. So, you know, in my persecutions, can I have the right, meek and gentle spirit of my Heavenly Father? rather than the angry temper. Uh, will I allow him to temper my spirit in the right way to shape me? You remember James says, consider it pure joy when you have persecutions of many, many kinds. Uh, you know, th these things develop, uh, they develop um, character in us, don't they, and perseverance. And in a way, a lot of this is the tempering of us by a loving God who wants us to grow. I mean, you know that there is generally no growth without, without pain. And there's generally no real growth without a deep-seated seeking of the things of God. And, uh, you know, we, we, are, we have opinions, we have histories, but it's our attitude. A blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And it starts with our attitude towards God, having a gentle uh, a meekness when we come to God to accept to accept that he is good as the foundation of our relationship with him. And I hope that makes sense. And each of these Beatitudes, to some degree, uh, we have to work at uh, because it, they are part of our sanctification, our discipleship, as I said at the beginning, as we grow in our faith to be more like Jesus. And more about meekness, we will look at Jesus uh, and, and his meekness in his relationship with his heavenly father when he was on this earth. So meekness, in another way, is the reception. This is, quite, this is quite an interesting when I found this. I had to really think this through. Meekness, or having a gentle spirit, is the reception of injury that comes to us with a belief that actually God will vindicate us. We have a lot of trouble in this life, don't we? And we do. Uh, and, and it's very simple. There's lots of injustices in this life. But again, the foundation of a gentle spirit and a meek spirit is 
We don't always have to get on our high horse. We don't always have to argue violently. Um, we don't have to even defend. We don't have to defend God or even defend ourselves. Having a gentle spirit is the understanding and the belief that God will vindicate us in the end. Whether it's in this life or the next life, uh, our lives will be vindicated by a totally holy and righteous God. And uh, that attitude of meekness actually does help us as Christians go through trials and sufferings. Uh, meek or meekness, of course, is closely linked to another word which we know very well, being humble or having humility. And um, uh, in Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul says this, uh, um, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received, being completely humble or sh and gentle, being patient, bearing with one another in love. So the Apostle Paul is telling us as Christians within the church, we need a gentle, meek spirit, not only in our attitude towards God, but now it comes to earth, we have this gentle spirit with one another in the body of Christ. That can be quite difficult. Um, but there are times when we will need to correct, uh, as, we, as we heard from 2 Timothy, didn't we? You know, all of scripture is God breathed, it's useful for rebuking, correcting, and, and training us. And sometimes we need to engage in those debates, one and another, uh, because we love one another. Do you know, one of the worst things is to, uh, if someone's caught in deception, for example, one of the worst things to do is to leave them in their state of deception. That isn't showing love. So having a gentle or meek spirit is actually in love to try to draw alongside and help someone in the right way in the right way so that they can uh, see the errors of their way and repent and stay within the fold, stay within the church and, uh, or stay within this group called church. Um, so humility and being gentle, meekness in its operation within the body of Christ is, is a vital characteristic and we are called to be that type of person and that is not easy. Um, and, uh, and we all know it's not easy. Uh, again, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, um, uh, Paul says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, there's the word, gentleness, and patience. So, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth, encompasses all of this other teaching. You know, I said that the charter of Jesus actually is, is the New Testament, it is the Bible. You know, we hear what the gospel is, you know, uh, how can we be saved? The, all of, the, uh, all of the, the simple statements of Jesus, they are all unpacked later on in the Bible. And so, meekness or humility is being unpacked, and here's just a couple of passages which tell us that we need to take on this spiritual characteristic of being gentle in heart towards God and also towards one another. Amen. And we know it is only the humble in heart, which is the meekness in heart, that doesn't fight against God um, or create uh, a struggle with God, but working with God, allowing God to temper us, that we can trust him in whatever is happening in our lives. You know, I think it is easy to be angry with God, and, and actually there's nothing wrong really in being angry with God, as long as we repent of it when we take on the gentle spirit that we're supposed to have. Okay, and we all go through cycles. There will be times when we kind of have a bit of, bit of a healthy argument with God rather than an unhealthy argument with God. It is easy to be, be angry or to be questioning my sickness my troubles, difficult people in my way, persecution has come my way. Why me, God? Why me, God? And uh, what have I ever done to deserve this? And in a sense, if we have those attitudes with, with real anger, not righteous anger, but just being angry, then that's the opposite of having a meek and a gentle spirit. It is not wrong to 
to discuss these things with God, but we need that gentleness of spirit to, to come to him, trusting, even if we don't know the answer, he is good and holy and righteous in his dealings with us. So meekness has a patience uh, in the reception, and patience when, when we feel injured. A meek, gentle spirit actually can cope with even, can cope with bad stuff happening to us because it's looking to God, it's looking in a, different, in a different context to what is actually happening. It doesn't mean that we're surrendering our rights. It doesn't mean that we're running away. It doesn't mean that we're cowards, not at all. But meekness and having a gentle spirit is the opposite of having a sudden anger or a sudden malice or a long harbored vengeance against God or against others. Can you see the contrast? So meekness um, is a complete and gentleness of spirit is not a weak thing. Um, it's so easy to flare up in anger, but meekness and gentleness of spirit actually is a very deep-seated thing of strong character, being in God, actually knowing that we trust him with whatever's going on, um, um, and that produces a different type of behavior in us which actually, when we can do the right behavior, we're actually allowing God to work through us and we're allowing him to vindicate us. Whilst we are angry in the situation, in a way, we're putting up a block. So in a way, we're, we're, we're kind of saying, I'll sort this myself. I don't want you, God, to come in and bring healing of relationships. I have to say that when I was a prison chaplain, very, very quickly, I was bullied, as you know. I had lots of contention. Um, and some of it was definitely my fault. I, you know, I was struggling uh, in, 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 in an environment of injustice against those who have done injustice. My attitude was the prison regime needs to be a good parent. It's almost like being a good father to wayward children in the hope that the wayward children can come back. It's a little bit like the prodigal son, okay, with unbelievers. Um, and anyway, in trying to do my job, I often cut across a regime that was bullying to the prisoners or unjust to the prisoner. And I was try trying to stand up for, for the oppressed in that sense, despite the fact they'd done terrible things. Really quite, quite a difficult thing to do. But I was trying to show Christ in the situation. But anyway, to cut a long story short, over the 10 years, eight months and two days I was there, many, many officers and many directors had deliberately bullied or done things they should not have done that were against the rules even, against me. But when I walked out of that prison, one by one across that period, all of these people came and apologized. They actually apologized to me before I left the prison. And uh, those that didn't apologize, actually some bad things happened. I'm not saying that, that vengeance is, is God's and God did vengeance on them, but those who hadn't apologized easily, some of them were fired, and actually two of them got very, very sick, um, and actually they nearly died, I, you know, but they didn't. And, but I'm, I don't know, but what I'm trying to say is, trying to live a godly life brings trouble, but actually vengeance is mine, and actually I will vindicate you, is what God is saying. And in my own experience, through very, very difficult times, and to give these people credit also, these people actually um, did actually come and apologize. And that was an amazing restoration. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I give them credit for that. You know, sometimes people in the world can end up having a more meek and humble spirit than people in the church. You know, it's not, this is not just exclusively, it is exclusively for Christians in what Jesus is talking about with the Beatitudes. It's a result of our Christianity. And some of us get further than others. But people can be meek and humble in the world just as part of their natural character. And I thank God for that and good on them for trying to do what is right. So anyway, there are two important or humble people I want to focus on from the Bible, okay? And uh, the first one is, is um, actually to do with the most humblest man that ever walked the earth at the time. And his name was, as you can read, Moses. We can read it in Numbers chapter 12. It says this, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses 
because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord only spoken through Moses, they asked? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. Okay. I hope you know this story. I'm going to quickly fill in exactly what, what happened and what happened to those who were grumbling against Moses. The incidents had occurred because Moses married a Cushite woman. He married outside of the Hebrews. And certainly later on when, well, within the law, you know, it was supposed to be marriage within the family of God. So, so Hebrew should marry Hebrew, Christian should marry Christian, and that's kind of the principle. But Moses married a Cushite woman, and they got uppity. Uh, they got upset, they got angry, and uh, Miriam and Aaron may well have been concerned or, or jealous over the influence that this Cushite woman would have over Moses, and actually pride rose up in them, and they turned against Moses, and they began to talk against Moses. Now then, and God says, Oi, all three of you come to me. And God was going to have a, a little bit of a chat uh, with Aaron and Miriam. And um, in 1 Peter uh, 5, B, 5, chapter 5, 5, verse B, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We know that God lifts up the humble, and he brings down the proud. And this incidence, with uh, pride rising up, or anger, or, or dissension uh, rising up against Moses from the two most important people next to him, his closest friends, you know, Aaron, who's going to become the high priest, and, and Miriam, his sister. And uh, anyway... God got very angry with Miriam and Aaron. He tells them off, and then he gives leprosy. Do you know the story? God gave Miriam the leprosy or the skin disease. And in Jewish thought, this is incredibly significant because if God gives a disease, then only God can heal the disease. Only God can take that disease away. So throughout the Old Testament and parts of the New Testament, leprosy was seen as being a curse from God. Okay? Now then, let's wind forward to Jesus. So we have humble Moses bringing the law of God in the Old Testament. We have Jesus who's the humblest man more than Moses, because Jesus is God in the flesh. And uh, now we have Jesus, who is healing lepers. People with this terrible skin disease are coming to Jesus. It caused a massive stir, because Jesus healing lepers, Jesus has to be God according to their, according to their thinking. And so, of course, Jesus is God. And yet they still, in their pride, refused to see all of the miracles that Jesus was doing and all the declaration that God has humbled himself, come to earth to serve mankind. It, it, rattled, their, it rattled their thinking completely to the core. But what we have here is God is vindicating Moses Moses is the humblest person of the Old Testament, and there was a consequence for Miriam rising up. The good news is, is God did take away the leprosy, and they all got on happily ever after. Okay? It ended really well with Miriam. Now then, when it comes to this biblical meekness, we have heard that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. But what did Moses do? What was Moses' mission on planet Earth? Well, he was to lead the children of Israel 
out, and he had many a schism with Pharaoh, and God used Moses, the humblest man, to bring the ten terrible plagues to teach Pharaoh a lesson, to bring down the pride of Pharaoh, the pride of Egypt, and to lift up the humility of Moses, and through Moses, take the whole of Israel out of Egypt. So in Moses, we have someone who is the meekest man on the planet, and yet he's a strong man. He's a strong leader. And despite everything that is happening, his relationship with God, God could use him, and he did amazing, tough things. So gentleness spirit, it, it, I'm using Moses as an example, doesn't mean that we're not strong as Christians, and it doesn't mean that stuff can happen because of our prayers or because of who we are in the world. We are to tear down strongholds. We, we, we have, as we'll see in a minute, we have a position on planet Earth by being a Christian. So we are not doormats. Moses was not a doormat. And God can use humble people to bring down the proud, which exactly what he did. And those 10 plagues of, of Egypt are very interesting. We are not doing a study on the 10 plagues at the moment. I'm not sure we might have done one in the past, I don't know. But each of the plagues was tearing down a god that Egypt worshipped. Each plague was tearing down a significant god that uh, the Egyptians worshipped. There was a frog god, for example, god of the flies, lord of the flies. And, um, and so this is a spiritual battle that is going on also. So meekness can have a strong spiritual dynamic to it. So um, I hope you've got that point. So Moses' meekness and humility towards God are spiritual characteristics that turn into power in the Holy Spirit to do the will of God, to speak God's rebuking words, and to bring down an empire. Amen? Amen. So there's a man called Lazio Tokes, I think. Has anyone heard of him? Okay. So a modern-day challenge, uh, to, certainly to national leaders, is this. There's a Hungarian pastor called Laszlo Tokes. He was at the center of the fall of the Ceausescus in Romania and communism in Romania. And I don't know if you know, but uh, uh, there's a large part, Transylvania used to be part of Hungary, but is now part of Romania. And uh, in this Transylvanian uh, region, Laszlo Tokes was a Christian uh, pastor. He was an assistant pastor, actually. Um, and uh, what had happened in Romania is the government had started to use Hungarian Bibles as toilet paper. Okay? So if you needed to defecate and you went to a public toilet in certain parts of Romania, the toilet paper would be pages of the Hungarian Bible. And the story goes, in fact, um, the, the man who started, I couldn't, I couldn't remember the name of the actual priest who started this massive, uh, this massive uh, thing in Romania. But he did come to Wycliffe Hall, where I was trained, to be a vicar. Uh, this little priest, boy, <laughs> he just oozed humbleness. He just oozed loveliness. He just spoke powerfully. And uh, what had happened was a, a little man, a Christian had uh, gone into, the, into a public toilet and he'd seen this. And he had righteous anger, rose up in him. And his righteous anger produced a sermon that went viral around all of the churches within a matter of days. Everybody was talking about it. And uh, he obviously did not use the pages of the Bible to wipe places that are not designed for that book. Okay, you can imagine, can't you? I hope a righteous anger is rising up in you when a society gets that bad, okay? And so Christians and pastors started to rise up and Lazo Tokes was a prominent figure. He started to preach and to speak out against the regime. And uh, the government tried to get rid of Tokes. They tried to uh, depose him from his post as an assistant pastor in Timia Sora. And they were trying to evict him from his church flat. 
And the whole congregation actually rose up uh, against it. You're not removing our pastor. And they rose up against the, the regime and, and they started to form chains around where he was living. And this started to be the pattern very quickly. It went viral. It went faster than Facebook, faster than Google. It just started hitting the whole country, mainly through the church. In Oradia, where Helen and I have been, we uh, met some of the pastors who were involved in this. And uh, we were taken to a particular church where the same thing was happening. The regime had risen up against the church because they were preaching, preaching holiness and righteousness and, and repentance. What does our country come to? Using the Bible as toilet paper. And the people were suddenly rising up. And uh, anyway, we went to this church and they'd come with guns and the congregation actually rose up and they held hands around that whole church where the pastor and his family were taking refuge inside and the whole congregation they joined hands and it was a standoff a standoff and one thing led to another and we all probably saw it i saw some of this happening uh, because very quickly the whole thing rose to a civil war the whole thing rose up uh, uh, down with the Ceausescu's and uh, very, very quickly, within about two weeks, from more or less start to finish, the whole regime came down and it was a complete collapse of communism in Romania. And in fact, the dates of the revolution are December the 16th, 1989, and it finished on December the 25th, 1989. From the 16th to the 25th of December, quite a Christmas present for that country, but then, as we all know, remove even a terrible regime, basically all hell started to break out, didn't it, in Romania, particularly with the orphan children. So the society started to collapse, and it, be, it was very, very difficult. But humble, righteous men rose, and uh, that whole country changed, and things are very different, of course, today. So, the humblest man in the Old Testament was Moses. He's the prophet of God who gave the law of God, the old covenant to the people. The meekest, the gentlest, the humblest man of all time, of course, is Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the prophet of God with a capital T. He's the prophet of God who gave the new covenant to the world in his blood signed, sealed, and delivered personally by Jesus. Jesus is meekness and humility personified, okay? Jesus also is wisdom personified. Anything that is good and holy and right, Jesus personifies all of it, because all of these characteristics are God's characteristics. And uh, in Philippians, uh, it says this, and this is talking about Jesus. Who, Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus... God is humble of spirit and heart. Jesus actually called himself humble. I'll put all three up, actually. Jesus um, called himself uh, humble uh, in heart. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon me. Take my yoke upon you. <laughs> and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. And of course, this is the true definition of biblical uh, humbleness and meekness. Jesus personifies uh, his own charter in this beatitude. And, uh, but then Jesus had righteous anger. He had strong words to say. He wasn't a pushover. And yet he's got all the right humbleness and meekness with his heavenly father and himself to be able to withstand the horrors that happened to him. So this meekness produced in Jesus perfect faith, perfect relationship, a perfect walk with God the Father. 
And uh, Jesus said in John chapter 5, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does, or does also. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. The same is true for us as a Christian. Without Christ in our lives, we can do, we can do nothing of ourselves that is holy, right, and true. But with Christ in us, boy, we can. And with Christ in us, and when the true characteristic rises, even regimes can fall. Amen. And uh, the time came for meek and humble Jesus to prepare himself for the cross. And of course, in Matthew, we have this. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Meek and humble Jesus on a humble animal, a beast of burden. And this happened after the new covenant Passover when Jesus runs or, or, or goes in on the donkey on Palm Sunday. And that last week led to the walk to the cross. Jesus in obedience suffered. He did not complain. He trusted fully his heavenly father. It doesn't mean he didn't struggle. He struggled in the garden of Gethsemane. Let this cup pass from me. But he did it in the gentle spirit, in the right attitude, in his discussion with God as his heavenly father. He also asked the ultimate question, didn't he, on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And of course, we know why. Because at that moment, he became sin. Sin cuts you off from God. Jesus, the Trinity, suddenly divided as, Jin, as, as Jesus becomes sin. Why have you forsaken me? But of course, he wasn't forsaken. It was the plan. Since before the foundation of the world, what would happen to him? Meek and mild, but strong Jesus. He would go to the cross. But because there is no sin in him, because he is the perfect of all the characteristics that he started his ministry with. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. It's Jesus in every, every one of them. Every single one of them. Sinless Jesus couldn't be held. So he rose from the grave victorious. Reunited, sat down at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. So Christian, uh, I was going to say Christian meekness is not weakness. Okay? Christian weakness is not meekness. So, moving to the, coming to the end, sorry? Oh, I didn't. Christian meekness is not weakness. Did I say Christian weakness is meekness? If I said that, strike it. <laughs> that is not true. Christian meekness is not weakness. I think we should say that together. Christian meekness is not weakness. Hallelujah. So, meekness akin to humble and humbleness is a deep-seated inner spiritual con condition that submits to God in everything, okay? And we can see this bridge, these building blocks being built. Meekness is based on humility, which is uh, expressed in the New Testament really as a supernatural quality that comes from us being a Christian and walking the Christian life as a renewed natured person. The renewal only comes when we surrender to God and when we are open to his divine will in our lives. It's the third step in the Beatitudes. So, we are saved, Beatitude 1, through a broken spirit. We are cleaned up, having repented through a repentant spirit. We are now growing in our Christian walk and we are becoming gentle and humble of spirit and we can be used powerfully by God, like Moses was, humblest in the Old Testament, Jesus, humblest who ever lived. And we learn to trust God as our Heavenly Father, Jesus as our Savior, and Holy Spirit, God with us now. And as the Apostle Paul put it, as we come uh, slowly to, well, quickly to a close in Philippians, Paul said it, okay? Paul said, I know what it is to be in need, I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. 
having a, gen a meekness of spirit is what he's talking about. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And that Paul, the, the most proudest pagan or Jewish Pharisee, is humbled by God and he's been knocked about, he's experienced stuff, but he comes to a place where his meekness and humility of spirit can say, with everything that has happened, whether I've got a lot or I've got a little, whether this is happening or this is happening, I trust in God. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strengths. And he went further, as we know, because he came to the ultimate place, if you like, of trust and humility and having a gentle spirit, uh, but with a very cutting edge. He said this, for to, for, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is a massive gain. That was his, that's the view. That's what the, uh, these Beatitudes are starting to produce in Christians, into us as Christians. So now to the blessing, which doesn't take so long. We've only got two pages left. So to the blessing. So that's what meekness is about. I hope you've seen a deeper view of what meekness is. I, I hope you've grasped hold of it and, and maybe take away the notes when they come or see this again. Um, you know, it, it, it's a powerful thing. But to the blessing. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So if we think about Jesus first, and then we and look at ourselves fairly quickly, it will slot together quite quick. Jesus' humility, his gentleness of spirit, led Jesus from heaven to earth to become one of us. We saw about that. He, he didn't consider equality with God. He humbled himself and became a man, okay? Jesus is the sinless human being. Jesus is the head of the human race under covenant, we did a lot of teaching on covenant, but Jesus is the perfect human being. He is our model, he is our aim, he is the one we follow. He is the head of humanity, the head of the human race. Adam did have authority over the earth, but in the fall he gave it away to Satan. He gave it to the devil, who is known as the prince of this world, and so humanity had lost the dominion of the earth. Also, humanity had changed spiritual fathers from God as father, actually, as we also saw in, in 1 John, to the devil as the, as the father. And so Jesus, he came, he humbled himself, and out of uh, the characteristics we're talking about, Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. We know his heel was struck, but he stamped on Satan's head, hallelujah. And that's the covenant stuff that we've taught on in the past. You can see it um, on our website. And because Jesus had no sin, he rose from the grave victorious. So, we are in a new situation. Satan is now a defeated foe. Jesus has inherited the earth. I don't know if you... Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus has taken back control. He has inherited, if you like, the earth from the evil one. Jesus has won the control, the power, the king over the earth, legally and legitimately through his humble and weak actions, serving humanity as a servant king. Jesus has taken back his inheritance, what is rightly his, which he gave freely to Adam, which got stolen, but Jesus has now won the whole thing back. He has taken control, or he is in control of the earth once again. Remember that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. So even before we were created, the plan was Jesus to be the head of humanity, to be the head of the tribe of human beings right from the beginning. And of course, we have this amazing statement. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. That world was given freely by God to Adam to rule and have dominion, and Adam just lost it. But Jesus has won it back. 
Jesus has inherited back the earth. So, no longer does Satan have the power. This is what meekness or being a Christian means. This is what being a Christian, having all of these characteristics growing in us, truly means. No longer does Satan have the power to dominate us. Because we've been born again into the family of God. Hallelujah. I know in whom I've believed he's able to keep me until that time when I'll get a new resurrected body. So Satan has lost dominion. Jesus has total power and control. When we become Christians, he's now our savior and God is our heavenly father. And we are taking on the characteristics of Christ. These are the Beatitudes, okay? This is where we're going. This is where we're heading. And so as his children and as his heirs, Christians inherit the earth and we are part of the kingdom which is on earth now. So, now how well we operate within his kingdom does depend on how well we apply the Beatitudes to our lives how well we live the way that God wants us to live. So we are part of this. We have inherited uh, the earth, but how well we function in this world, partly is down to us and partly down to our discipleship. But these are the truths that God would say to us. Okay, it's there, Romans 8. Oops. It won't go back. My... Can we go back? The clicker's broken on the back. Romans 8, 4 in closing. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. What this means really is, blessed are the meek, they've inherited the earth. We are part of that inheritance. We are part of inheriting the earth already. But of course, that means something. We, we have power, we have the power of prayer. We can operate in this realm with a measure of power. And we can, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the speaking of God's word, through the answering of our prayers, we are inheriting or we have a part in this earth, okay? However, however, we know that there's a new heaven and there's a new earth. So blessed are the meek, blessed are the Christians who are, who are Christians, have gentle spirit, we will inherit the new heaven and the new earth. That will be our home for eternity. It's an amazing and it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant blessing. And um, if you think about it, uh, we don't need to do that. And so to conclude this, I hope you now understand uh, what meekness or gentle of spirit is. It's a strength for a Christian, it's not a weakness. Um, it's powerful and it takes us into a new place, a new attitude we've got on ourselves and it gives us a position and, and it does. It helps in our behaviors. Blessed are the meek or the humble or the gentle of spirit because we have inherited, we will inherit. We're going to inherit people of God. Some of you are more meek than others. Some of you are more humble than others. But the work of God has started in every Christian. And this is the Christian charter. And sometimes we might have difficulty in our lives, partly because God allows it to, to make us more humble, to deal with the pride that's in our life, because God wants us to have a meek and gentle spirit like his son Jesus. But the more we grow, the more we learn, the more we hand over the trust to God in our lives, actually the more like Jesus we're going to look. But the blessing that we can hold on to is, it's a good, good blessing. We will be inheritors of the new kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth that is coming for eternity. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. Where's David?
God bless. David. I think we've got one song to close. So well done.